Hey, there we go. Server side development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Neil Sharoni, and I'm the server-side architect at MyHeritage. Um, we're going to talk today about the MyHeritage Family Graph API and what it is and how we have decided to you know, implement it on at MyHeritage. Um, I've been working at MyHeritage since 2004. Um, and let's go ahead and, and talk about this. Is this too far for this? All right. All right, so what is MyHeritage? Um, how many people here, by raise of hand, have heard about MyHeritage? All right, so quite a few. Um, any MyHeritage users here? All right, okay, so that's nice. So what is MyHeritage? Just a few words about MyHeritage. MyHeritage is basically a social network for people who are interested about their family history and they want to research about, about their, their ancestors and to find out more about their family. Um, some of our users are, you know, hardcore genealogists are really into uh, doing some research. They go into graveyards and doing some research on various uh, historical records. But we have a lot of I mean, users who are just into finding more about their family. And we are providing their, them with a platform that allows them to do this research. So we're mostly about discovering new relationships or new family members that you didn't know or, or new information about your existing family. Uh, we're providing you tools to preserve this information and lastly to share this with other family members and to expand your research. And our talk is about big data. Um, with MyHeritage has a lot of uh, information about the users. Um, just, these are just basic numbers. We have 80 million users on the system. We're talking about two billion family tree individuals in trees. So we're talking about both people who are both might be dead or alive in various family trees. Um, more than two million profiles are being added to family trees every day. In total, we have 6.4 billion historical records and we're talking about um, census reports. We're talking about newspaper archives, books, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, we have photos. This the entire operation is available in 42 different languages, which is very important for us because we are a, a global uh, leader in that field. And we're sending out about 2 million daily emails. OK, so what is Family Graph? Family Graph is a complete set of API tools that we use both internally and externally to access all the data within the company. So we're using it both to access the data and to modify it. Everything is available through this portal, familygraph.com, which provides all the information about this API, documentation. Feel free to go into it later on. All right, so let's talk about some architectural consideration that we took uh, when we first decided to uh, develop this API. Oh, well, it was very important for us from day one to use industry standards because we didn't want to uh, in, you know, reinvent the wheels our main goal was to allow other partners to use this API. It's, you know, it's impossible for us to you know, teach others how to do something that's not standard. It was very, very important for us to do, be able to do both read and write through this API. Uh, we're talking about private information about the users. So we have information about their, um, their people's children, their photos, when they were born, some sensitive information like that. So it's very, very important that this API has very tight in security. It doesn't expose information that we don't want to that, that to be revealed to the outside world. Uh, hello? Yeah. Uh, we need to be able to lo uh, manage the server load. We're talking about um, millions and millions of requests every day with a lot of data. And this is not working very well for me for some reason. Uh, we need, maybe I'll need to stand closer. We need to have very good visibility on what's going on in the API to be able to monitor everything. And uh, at, the end, at, the end, at the end of the day, just talking about big data. So we need to be able to 
um, process this very, very fast. Um, we were inspired by these um, big names because they have very similar APIs, but at the end of the day, we actually implemented almost everything ourselves uh, within the company in addition to integrating with specific modules that we got on, on the internet. All right, so let's talk about some of the standards that we're using. It's very, very simple. We're using HTTPS protocol on top of REST. Uh, these are different ver uh, verbs that we use to man manipulate the data. We're using get to read content from the family graph, using post, patch, put, or delete to modify the content. Uh, simple HTTP headers to uh, communicate back to the clients on stuff like, you know, stuff like content type, expiration, and stuff like that. Everyone knows about this. We're using auth to, uh, as the authentication protocol. And everything is done with using JSON format, use both requests and re responses. So just a few words about the data model at MyHeritage. Um, there are over 500 different objects in the system. This is like a very simple glimpse of the, uh, an overview of the system. At the basic point, we have a user. The user is a member in a specific family website. The family website is a framework that allows him, that gives him a very close and secure place for him to manage his family tree. A site can, has a, can have multiple trees. Trees can have multiple individuals. A site can have photo albums. Albums can have all sorts of media files. And there are like about 500 different objects like this. And they're all interconnected. Okay, so just look at an example of a call to how to use Family Graph to get information on a specific object. In this case, we're getting information on a specific site. So we're issuing a get request on familygraph.myheritage.com and requesting an object. And this is the identifier of the object. In this case, it's just a site with, with a, some sort of a number that identifies it. And the server re will return this response with all this information that is available through the Family Graph API documentation. So we can see information like the name of the site, the, um, the link for the site, um, the, whether it's a ping site or a basic site, um, information about the, user, about the site's creator, all stuff like, that, like this. And what I want to point out is that some of these properties that are being returned are very primitive, they're strings or numbers, but some of these are actually other objects. For example, the creator in the response is actually a property of type user, sorry, actually allowing um, a response to uh, contain other objects within uh, objects. Okay, let's talk about some of the fields. Okay, so each of the, each, each of the 500 different objects in the system has a set of fields that are either writable or readable. This is just an example for the site object. You can see we talked about it before a few seconds ago. We have a name, description, the plan, have a type for each one, and whether each one is readable or writable. Um, and a description, all of this is available through the family graph uh, portal. Uh, this is the documentation that's being created by us. Uh, so what are fields? We talked about this, uh, the, these are the property of the objects. And basically, uh, a field is a one-to-one -one relationship between, um, could, be, could be seen as a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, objects. So a, member, a membership object will have just one user. A membership will have just one site. So the user object is a field of the membership object. A site, it will be another field of the membership object. All right, so let's, we can look at some more elaborate re uh, get requests that we used where we used the field uh, parameter. So this is the same request as before, we're looking information on this site, but this time we're adding a parameter called fields and we're requesting a specific field. And we can use a, the comma to separate multiple fields. This allows the clients to actually narrow down and to request only specific information that, that it needs. And for us on the server, it's really useful because it will also reduce the calculation time because only we don't need to calculate information on the, what specific the, users has spe um, the user had requested. For. And we have a special value, the asterisk, where we want to get all the fields of the object. Um, like I said before, this provides a faster response time. The server has to do less work. And instead of getting all this bulk of information to the back to the client, which will be all the fields of, all the, um, of the entire object, we'll get exactly what the client has requested. In this case, we're only getting the name, the creator, and the plan. All right. So we talked about fields. 
Um, and another thing we have is our connections. So connections is the way that we connect objects on the system. And the distinction is that the field is just a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship where connection is a one-to-many connection. So we saw before in a diagram, we said that the site can have multiple trees or a tree can have multiple individuals in it. So this is an example of the site object. This is a list of all the various um, connections and the site can have multiple trees and multiple albums, multiple media files. Each one of them is an array of albums in, in the system. And like these, any, any one of these could be read or written to. Hello, yes. All right. As like before, this is the one-to-n connection between the objects and their connections. I think I just have to stand here. All right. Um, when you're requesting in a connection, uh, it's quite possible, since we're talking about arrays of objects, to get a, like a very long list. Like I'm, like I'm starting with a site, and I want to get all the photos in the site. A site can have uh, hundreds of thousands of photos. It's very, very impossible. When we're talking about big data and like m maybe even millions of individuals in one tree, you, they would want to be able to paginate the system. So pagination is a must in a big data system. So when we're asking, um, this is a sample of a request for a connection called individuals in a specific tree. Um, and this is, will get you all this information. So we're getting an array. Can you see or am I on the way? We're getting an array of objects. Each one of the objects is of type individual. And we're getting the information about, about, the, inform about, uh, about the number of individuals. It's actually a short list, just three individuals. Uh, what's going on here? Okay. Um, another important thing that we added was the ability to request multiple objects in one call. C if we didn't have this, then clients would have to issue multiple requests, which is not very efficient. Let's say I want to get start with a site or with a user, and with the user I want to get his sites, then I want, to, given the sites, I want to get to hit the, um, the site's logo and stuff like that. And instead of doing it in multiple requests, um, uh, we are allowing the user to request this in just one call. So here we're starting with the user object. And what we're requesting is the personal photo, which is an object by itself. And for that photo, we're actually asking for the URL. So with just one call, we're getting the URL of the user's personal photo. And it will look like this. This, this is the user, this is the user, this is the personal photo object, and this is the URL in the response. Okay. Um, this nesting uh, can also be, can be made on connections. So we'll look at the more complex example, and then we'll move on. This is a request for a family tree object. In that tree, we want the individual's connections. So we actually want all the individuals in the tree. But for each, uh, each one of the individuals, we want the name, his events, which is another connection. And for each of the, one of the events, we want the type. So this will give us this. 5,000 individuals in the tree. This is one individual. This is another one. This one has events, and these are the types. Okay. Um, in terms of error checking, we do ever all the basic stuff, you know, uh, making sure the request are valid, authentication is passing, the user is authorized to do the request, um, 409, um, 404, 429 in terms, if, if a client is issuing too many requests, we want to slow it down. Um, just the basic stuff that we're all familiar with. Um, and in addition, we have some more parameters which are very useful in a big data system. We talked about the pagination, so we're using the offset and the in the limit parameter to control the exact page that we want to proceed in terms of iterations. We're using a filter parameter which allows clients to narrow down the, li the list of results they're getting based on specific uh, criteria. The query parameter can be used to search with, um, for let, let's say I um, want to search for specific individuals with a specific name within all the tree. And like I said, we're supporting 42 different parameter languages so we can just specify the um, language in which you want the response to be in. Um, so up until now, we saw examples of how to read content from the family graph, but we are actually using it for also to, to make changes in the family graph. So let's look at some, some CRAD operations. The post verb is actually used on the, on the parent's connection to add content to the family graph. Um, just look at an example like this. 
This is the site, and we're using the albums connection. So if this was a GET request, we'll get all the albums in that specific site. But since this is a post request, we're actually using this request to add a new album to the site. And in the request, we're actually sending a JSON request that specifies all the attributes of the new album. Each one of these uh, fields has to be writable in terms of the scopes um, um, that we said before, that each one of the fields can be either read-only or writable. And uh, as a response, we'll get the new object that was just created in the system. Some of these parameters will be set automatically by the system. Some of, them, uh, some of the properties were set by the caller itself. Okay, Edit, editing content is done through the put or patch verbs on a specific object. In this case, we got this new album which we just created. We want to, up to update it and we're using the put command and we're setting all these properties. This will actually replace the old object with a new one. And lastly, if you're using a patch command on the same object, this allows us to set specific properties in the field without overriding all the other ones. So this will just uh, set values for the just the properties that you're sending. Deleting an object is very simple, using the delete command on the specific object. It's just a bit about the, the system itself. Um, it was very important for us to separate access to those family graph servers from the regular web servers that serve all the web users. So we have two clusters. So one is the web service itself, which serves the, the Meritage website. Another set serves just family graph requests. Um, each one of them has underlying databases. We're talking about Cassandra, we're talking about MySQL, um, some shared infrastructure like uh, you know, memcache servers, talking about storage servers. And this infrastructure allows us to separate, hello, I'm just starting. This allows us to control um, access to various components in the system. In terms of caching, there are different levels of cache that we can employ here. We have client-side cache, which are cache, caches which are controlled by the server, but with the expires and the cache controls um, headers. And um, some of the API resources actually manage a, a marker, which means that the client remembers the last state that the, the cache was in or when it was, it was last updated for each request. The client can issue, uh, can include in the request the header telling uh, the server the state or the when that object was last updated. And if the server knows that nothing has happened, it will tell back to the client that nothing has changed. In addition, we have server-side caching, which are MD5s on the actual requests. And this allows the server to uh, issue back responses rather quickly without having to go to all the different algorithms and databases to calculate the responses. You again using the same expirations and cache control systems and this reduces the hit rate by about, about 30 percent. All right. In terms of uh, authentication, we're using OAuth2 like I said before. Uh, we're using all kinds of scopes uh, properties to define what can be done in the system. Um, each client, each client that accesses the system is granted a set of properties that it, it can do. For example, a specific basic client can only read content from the system, another can um, perform searches or stuff like that. And then the user needs to authorize that client on his behalf and to say which one of the specific scopes that the client has are granted for that specific user. And each one of the requests um, that, that the client has made on, on the behalf of the user is actually verified on the server and we make sure that the client doesn't perform operations that the user didn't allow. Like I said, there are two types of operations. One of them is read and one is write. And based on that, we know if the request is valid. Um, okay, so we are getting a lot of love requests on the system about I think it's 200 million or 400 million requests a month on this API, and we need to make have a make a way to make sure that clients are not abusing the system. So we're using a, some sort of rate limiter to to count how many times a client is actually requesting access to the system, and based on that, we're calculating a window that says, okay, you have a 60 seconds window in which you can make 120 requests, 
and if you're exceeding this limit, you have to wait another 60 seconds, another five seconds, depending on the rule. This is al allows us to control and enforce the business logic of the system. And if we see that some of the partners or clients are misbehaving, we can either you know, shut them off all completely or just have no wait and, and, and without harming the system. And this is how, what it looks like in the response for a, a client exceeding the, the limit. We say we give him back uh, 4, 429 and ask him to retry again after 60 seconds. In terms of vis vis visibility, it's very important for us to monitor that everything is working fine all the time. You can see a graph that shows about, um, it's about 400 million requests that are made on a, week this is a weekly basis. Um, so the graph is growing all the time. In terms of some stats, we're getting about 100 milliseconds response time for all our API requests. Right now, we have about 100 different clients, just a bit more than 100 different clients that are using the system. We have both internal and external clients, so everything that we write within the company itself is based on top of Family Graph API. It's very important for us you know, to use whatever we're preaching to the other partners. And we, like I said, we have about 500 different objects and connections in the system. We use all sort of LK, uh, ELK stacked um, tools to you know, monitor the system. We use a Kibana, we use a Graphite just to make sure everything is working correctly in the system. In the system. And we're using a PRTG to monitor for all kinds of sensors. If, if something goes bad, we know about it immediately and we can apply a fix. Uh, in terms of uh, scaffolding, um, it was very important for us to make it easier for developers to add new objects to the system because this is a growing system. So um, the system was de um, devised in a way that all developers can easily add com com I mean objects and define the properties each of each of the objects. In the definition itself, uh, the developer defines the properties, the, um, the security, the scopes, um, documentation, everything is, um, generates uh, metadata that then later gets available through the family graph portal, through the API, so doesn't, we don't need to maintain any documentation offline. This is actually the link to get all the documentation on family graph, familygraph.com slash documentation. And once we create a new object and we set all the properties in the code, this is what it, it will look like, just a page in the documentation. We actually have a scaffolding utility which we use that allows developers to not have to go into the code itself to create new objects. We do it through the CLI, CLI tool, which makes it a lot of faster in terms of velocity in developing code. Um, so in terms of use case, I mean, who is using the family of API? We are, first of all, we're using it internally. All our utilities, all our, all our uh, clients internal, like Family Tree Builder, which is our desktop client, which uh, users use to manage their tree within their computer, uses it. All our billing and payment infrastructure is based on top of it, so we have a lot of billing-related objects in the family graph. The, mobile, the Heritage mobile app is, ev is based from the ground up on family graphs. Every API call is made on top of it. And in addition, we have external clients. So we have all these partners that we, um, Gene is actually part of my heritage, but all these partners actually use Family Graph to enhance their features. So we have all these functionality, like matching technology, um, you know, information about family trees, and if, if you want to develop an app or your partner that has already has a family tree but you want some functionality that MyHeritage has but you don't want to spend time to develop it, you access it through the Family Graph. So some conclusions and pitfalls that we um, found al along the way when we first devel started developing this API. The first one is that you need to start really early with an API, because if you don't, you end up with a lot of legacy API calls that you developed over the years, and you have to start managing each one separately, and each one is, works a little bit differently than the other one, so you have to start and spend some time thinking about it as soon as possible. Um, one unified set of APIs is very, very important. It's, um, it's important because we, as consumers or partners as consumers, don't have to spend more time learning about new APIs. Everything is done through one entry point. Uh, all, all, the, all the authentication is made, made one point. And it's very el also very easy for developers to add new APIs because they don't have to think about everything from scratch. 
we, it's important to use this, if you're developing an API like this, you have to use it internally. Don't develop an API just for partners, because then you'll never fix bugs, and will never be working very efficiently. You have to eat your own dog food. You have to get a good one. All right. Um, it's very important to make it uh, imp easy to extend, so we can add more objects later on. This is where the scaffolding utility that I mentioned comes into play because you don't want your developers to spend all this time writing code just to add new objects. Um, backward comp compatibility. Since we have all these partners that are using this API, we cannot make all these um, changes and break backwards comp compatibility. You have to think about this, all the changes before you make them. And prepare for high load in terms of you know how many servers you need and your topology. Um, develop SDKs if you want partners to be able to integrate your system you know, easily without having to write their own code. And lastly, you have to test everything. Add automatic tests, add unit tests, test, 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 because if it doesn't work, no one's gonna use your API. Um, in terms of our roadmap, I'm gonna go, go through this very, very quickly, sorry. Okay, so we're enhancing the right functionality for the API. Um, not all the objects in the system pr um, provide the right functionality. God, most of them do, but we want to add more functionality for that. Uh, we want to extend the graph and to add more and more objects based on uh, our MVPs. We want to add, obviously, more partners and more clients that will use the system. And, and recently, we're starting to add um, what we call Family Graph QL, which is an extension of Graph QL on top of Family Graph, which is a way to um, interact with Family Graph in a more robust and a more um, finely controlled system, which allows clients to have a better control of their requests and their responses. Thank you.